Welcome to Stuff My Therapist Says, powered by Macon Wellness. I'm your host, Sarah Macon, and I'm glad you've taken the first step to healing and becoming happy again by listening to our podcast. Together with my exceptional Megan Wellness team, as well as other reputable authors, leaders, and mental health professionals, we'll be shedding light on key aspects of mental health and providing actionable tips, strategies, and advice to making healing a reality in your life. With each new breakthrough, we do our part to eradicate the stigmas surrounding mental health, and each episode of this podcast is built to help you overcome the obstacles impacting your life today. Let's begin. Welcome back to Stuff My Therapist Says. I'm your host, Sarah Macon, and today we have an amazing guest. We have John Perkis. John, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for inviting me back. Nice yeah, to see you. Of course, it's so nice to see you too. So I'm so excited to connect with you and get to share about your new book with our audience. So what inspired you to write this new book? Uh, well, it's really simple. Um, the um, Octopus Books declared that The Power of Letting Go was a bestseller about a year ago. And then my agent said, oh, you can." they want you to produce a journal based on the book. And it'll take you three or four hours. Uh, it took me three or four weeks, but that's fine because <laughs> I, <laughs> I wanted to make sure that everything was correct. I, I don't know if you've been through this process, but when you start taking words out and adding pictures, it changes the meaning. Mm -hmm. So then you have to go back and realign everything and make sure it means what the original book meant. So that's what took the time. <laughs> wow, wonderful. So that's that's great. So you put together this journal and it took more time than expected and it was definitely time well worth it because it is such a wonderful and very helpful journal. So could you share a couple of insights from Learn to Let Go? Yes, certainly. Uh, one thing I should say is that the text, so the power of letting go was something like 35, 40,000 words and Learn to Let Go only has one third of the text. So some people will be relieved to know that they've taken out virtually all of the information about me uh, and all kinds of stuff. And so it's a, it's two thirds shorter. And then what's been put in instead is very nice illustrations and also space for doing exercises. So I think it'll reach a whole, a whole new market because there are lots of people very busy. They're not into reading 200 page books. They just want to get straight into it. So, so there are those people. And also those people who enjoyed the power of letting go and actually want a dedicated journal that they can work on so it's essentially well, the reason i'm saying that is it's the same material right mm -hmm. um but in terms of insights the ones that i find if i just step back a bit there are three steps to letting go and i'd like to share steps two and three but just to be clear the first step is about observing your thoughts which i'm sure you do a lot with your clients and increasingly people are getting used to the idea that they can observe their thoughts and then decide which ones are helpful and which ones are not the two things I'd like to emphasize are the next steps, which go much deeper. So the, the second step is about is the is the completion technique, which I began to learn nine years ago in India, and it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. I mean, ultimately you, you become enlightened if you keep doing it, right? Uh, so the completion technique boils down to a very simple instruction, which is relive to relieve. So we all have pain going all the way back to early childhood. If we relive it intensely in the present, we relive the pain and then and then that pain stops running our lives. Now it sounds simple. <laughs> There's a lot more, you know, people go all around the houses and but it boils down to that, relive to relieve. And the third one, which is also very simple and profound, is let go completely, otherwise known as surrender, which goes completely against most of Western culture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but is also extremely effective. Yeah. So they're both really simple. They're both extremely effective and they both go against a big chunk of Western culture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And some, I mean, sometimes if you're doing what everyone else is doing and you're not yeah. experiencing a good result, you know, sometimes mainstream culture is not the best yeah. for you. Well, that's where I got to with, uh, I mean, I got there, as you may recall, I got there when I was 26, you know, so I, I won first prize at business school and then got clinical depression. So I realized, hmm, I'm missing something here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, so that's, that's how it starts, right? Yeah. 
And it's interesting too, because doing things to get external validation it's, yes. it's not a good thing because you're always going to be chasing the next accolade or the next yeah. business or the next whatever. And you can have this empty feeling inside yes. and it's like the short term dopamine hit whenever you quote unquote win, but that's yeah. not realistic. I agree. Yes. I mean, the, the guru who I follow, Swamiji, he has lots of great teachers and the phrase some of them use is that you're going around gathering certificates from people. Yeah. You know, so, so somebody liked my post on Instagram, or that's a certificate, or I won this prize at school. That's another certificate. But inside, you feel like it's never enough. And that never enough feeling is is definitely real. Yeah. So, yeah. So I agree with you on that one. Yeah. So can you speak a, a bit about the benefits of journaling? That's a very good question. I suppose I do do it. I haven't consciously journaled, but I, I can tell you what I do and I can tell you the benefits, right? Okay. So what I've been doing, because I'm still on this journey and it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. So one thing I've been doing for the last few months, guided by one of Swamiji's teachers who lives in London, she she got us to do, and I did it again this morning. So what I typically do is I, I wake up quite early, usually I meditate and then I sit, I make a cup of coffee or whatever, and I sit down and I look at myself in the mirror right, which most people don't want to do. And she taught us to do this. It's called self completion. So you're completing, it's the completion technique, relive to relieve, but you're completing with the person in the mirror, right? Who you genuinely, generally avoid look, looking, looking at, right? So you sit and you look in the mirror. And then what I do, the journaling part is, I write down whatever comes up. And I remember this from having depression in my mid 20s, the early morning was always the worst. Mm -hmm. And it was like all the garbage came up in the night and was sitting there ready for me when I woke up. Right. And now I'm, you know, I'm healthy. I haven't had de depression for a very long time, but I know that the garbage typically comes up in the morning. It's mm -hmm. there waiting for me. And so the journaling part is I sit there and I listen to myself and I look at myself in the mirror and I write down whatever comes up. And that can be two or three lines. It can be a whole page, but, but then I know what I need to complete. Sometimes you get instructions or reminders like you need to do this or that. And sometimes it's just, oh, here's an issue that you need to face up to and address. Because if you don't, if you just suppress it, which is what most people do, most people don't look at it, they suppress it, and it just carries on running their lives, you know, mm -hmm. which unfortunately is the human condition. So to answer your question, I find that that journaling phase of writing down is very helpful because the mind will, well, my mind at least, will stop trying to push me away. But no, I've written it down. I need to deal with this. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Cause even though you know it's good to do, sometimes there's that resistance to not do what's going to be best. Of course, yes. Yeah, I mean, all kinds of things are good for us. And then if we're not careful, we find reasons not to do them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned for you, historically, it's been in the morning. I'm the same way. It's oh, when okay. I wake up, I joke with my team and my husband, I wake up my I get out of bed like this and I'm just like amped up immediately as soon as I wake uh, up and uh, I have to calm myself down because if not, I'll just be like too high energy and high strung. And so that's typically when I journal too is in the morning okay. and I just do a brain dump of sometimes it's ideas and sometimes yeah. it's like paragraphs, but other times it's like, this is what I'd like to do or this is an idea that I have. Yes. And so I yes. write it down when, first thing. Yeah, when the mind is empty. I mean, some people do it last thing at night, which is also good, you know, because they, I mean, I don't have this so much, but some people, they get clogged up with things during the day, you know, like someone trod on my foot in the shopping mall or mm -hmm. something happened and, 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 and they need to empty at the end. I mean, you can do both, you know, just empty it all onto the paper and then complete whatever you need to complete. You know? Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, that in of itself is such a game changer because – you don't empty your thoughts in your brain and if you're not journaling and you keep all that stuff inside it's not yeah, good yeah. for you no it's not good no <laughs> <laughs> definitely not so how do you suggest readers approach the journaling prompts in your book to get the most out of the experience well i i always speak and write from my own experience i don't i don't try and do everything all at once i just sit there because I know people who will sit there for an hour and then they've completely dried up. They're just sitting there. I don't do that. I just, I sit and write 
I write and then when it stops coming, I just stop and I come back later. I think that that helps. I'm the same actually writing books. I write until I dry up, which can be like two minutes or an hour or three hours. I, I don't force anything. Mm -hmm. you know, I find these things, I suppose what we're talking about is a kind of a download, right? Like the mm -hmm. download comes and then it may just stop. Well, okay, there's no point pushing yourself or, you know, criticizing yourself, but it's not happening. You can just do something else. And then I imagine you've had this experience. The download may restart while you're walking down the street or oh, yeah. in the shower. Oh yeah, or like when you least expect it, or like More when you're driving, or yeah, it's it's very interesting. Never I type things it. in my iPhone. I use the notes page, so sometimes something comes and I just type it into there so I don't forget it. So yeah, oh, but at nice. least it's out of my brain and it's in the iPhone. Oh yeah, getting things out of your brain is so important. Before yeah. I used to try to remember things, and I used to in my twenties. Now yeah, I yeah. cannot. <laughs> So well, I, I, I always it's also similar down. to decluttering. I mean, so, you know, I studied economics and um, there's this idea in economics that more goods and services make you feel better. And what I noticed is I actually it's the opposite. There are certain things that I love to use and I have them as possessions. But but actually, in general, I feel better with fewer things. So it's a bit it's very similar. Um, I go to the, we, I don't know if you have them in the US, we have these charity shops that sell unwanted things, charity stores, right? Oh, yeah, yes. I go I go to the charity store several times a week. Like, I don't need that CD, I don't need that book, I don't need that jacket. I, I just go there. And I fit, I mean, it's not, you know, I don't live in a monastery, but I just I just feel better. The, the more I unclutter, the better I feel. And the faster things happen. And that's that's physically and mentally. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm the yeah. same way too. I don't like clutter at all. And like my home is typically clean and I don't have a lot of stuff. I just don't like it. Especially when you're wanting to focus on something. It can be very difficult when you have all this stuff or this clutter around yeah. you. I went through this process years ago of just getting rid of things that were not bringing me joy anymore or just things that I didn't like or just things that I didn't necessarily need or want to have and yeah. almost like a minimalism journey. That's, that's really what it was. And yeah, yeah. that in of itself helps out so much with not buying things mm -hmm. like with it. It helps with not buying things that are not necessary. And also it, it's, it's less stuff to take care of and less stuff to think about. And your focus exactly. is so much better. Yeah, it's it's kind of mentally draining to have these things. I mean, the latest thing I did, I've I've still got CDs, mm -hmm. uh, and and I realized, so I've got classical CDs and I've got pop music or whatever rock music, and then I looked, I realized, well, some of that rock music I haven't listened to, and then I realized for ages, I realized it's because I find the lyrics a bit negative, yeah, and then there's some which I find uplifting. So I thought, and I keep listening to that. So I thought, well, I'll just take all the negative stuff. I mean, actually, I gave that to the charity store. With some books, I've just thought, this book is so unhelpful, I'm going to destroy it. I'm not going to let anyone else read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so they, you know, they may enjoy the music. That's okay, but, you know. Yeah, that's too funny. Oh, my gosh. We're back to burning books, everyone. <laughs> yes. back, back to the Middle Ages. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's too funny. So what advice would you give to someone who is struggling to, to let go? Uh, what, let go in general? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, there are the three steps in the book, and then there's a further step, which is going in the next book, uh, which I can also talk about. So the the, the three steps. So what, one is, briefly, one is just observe your thoughts. Write down, write down your thoughts, whatever you need to do, and then figure out which ones are not helpful, like prejudices or conclusions or judgments. There's a whole list of them in the book, right? So when you write down your conclusions and judgments and you'll quickly realize some of these are unhelpful, I'm just going to get rid of them. That's not complicated, right? Uh, the second one we've just talked about, which is doing the completion exercise so that you can remove the pain patterns which are causing this stream of negative thoughts, right? And the third one is, is surrender. So the, the letting go completely part, there is a technique which is not in these books but is easily accessible online and it's called unclutching. Uh, so if anybody wants to do that, they can go. I'm going to put it in the next book because it's it's brilliant. So there's a six-minute video on YouTube, 
and it's called, I can always send you the link afterwards, but it's an initiation into the technique of unclutching by Sri Nityananda Paramashivam. You can also, you can put the spelling in your show, show notes. <clears throat> but what he, I can tell you what it boils down to. The, the pr principle is incredibly simple. And it's actually also very similar to transcendental meditation, which I've done for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So the, the principle is this, you know, we all have thoughts. And when we have a thought, nearly everybody makes the unconscious decision to engage with that thought. So you have a thought and you might find it painful so you repress it or you might disagree with it so you think up counter arguments or you might just follow it in which case you're pretty quickly lost in the past or the future or miles away you know you you have one thought which leads to another thought which leads to another thought but basically <clears throat> what we don't realize is we've taken the unconscious decision to engage with it and we don't have to make that decision so the the other decision which most people are not making is just not to engage with it it's a bit like, maybe it's a bad analogy, but you know, if, if a child or a dog or anybody is trying to get your attention, you, you, you can give them your attention, but you may choose not to. It's a decision, right? Yeah. And it's the same with thoughts. Is if you choose not to, give, not to engage with this thought, Swamiji calls it unclutching. Like, and, and in the US, you have automatic cars but generally. But if you imagine a stick shift car and you unclutch, you basically disengage then what happens is there's this kind of empty space and then another thought comes and you don't engage with that either. And for a lot of us, it feels kind of, it can feel like intellectually lazy or I'm not facing reality or I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not doing what I should be doing. But yeah. in fact, it's extremely helpful because this stream of thoughts is trying to grab your attention the whole time. If you, if you choose not to engage with it, after a while, they start to die down, and you're in you're in a state of pure consciousness, mm -hmm. which is what meditation is all about. The thing is that you can, if you if you do completion and unclutching, if you do both of them, that's when people start. Basically, the thoughts per second go down and down and down and down. And I've had this I had this experience um, eight years ago after I spent three weeks on the ashram with Swamiji. I was doing loads and loads of completion, which is in chapter three. I, I may have told you last time I was walking across the park. And I suddenly realized, well, I must have had a thought, but basically there were no thoughts. I was walking across the park and I could see trees and clouds, but there were practically no thoughts. And I went to the office wow. and I was like making a cup of tea and having conversations with people while not thinking. And so wow. it's like a Satori type thing. It went on for 36 hours. Uh -huh. I know other people who've had it for a week. But if you do unclutching, which I've just described, very, very simple technique and completion, that's the kind of thing that happens and then eventually realize it's not necessary to think all the time it really isn't you can do all kinds of things without a whole load of thoughts and life and life becomes blissful and the other thing is that you know i mean this is the path to enlightenment life becomes blissful and the right things happen at the right time so it is surrender i mean in one of swamiji's books he says surrender is enlightenment then you will know the truth and my experience is when I unclutch, when I don't engage with my thoughts, I'm quickly in that surrender state. Mm -hmm. And of course, of course, Westerners get very anxious then because, you know, a whole load of a whole load of us have I'm not I'm not an atheist, but a lot of Westerners have become atheists mm -hmm. or, or they're religious, but they don't really believe in God. Right. So the, the big fear is, well, if I unclutch, if I let go completely, then my life will fall apart. Right. It doesn't. It all falls into place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the irony, right? So we've been conditioned to believe that we have to control everything. And what's interesting is when you stop trying to control everything, it all kind of sails along. <laughs> yeah, and it's not possible to control everything. So it's, it, that thought or, or that belief is really illogical because it's not possible to control other people or to control the government or to control the, I mean, all you can really do is, is lead yourself. Truly. Well, the, the way I explain it to people is, you know, if you look out the window, you can, well, hopefully it depends on the window. If you look out the window, you can see, you know, trees are growing and birds are flying and people are walking up and down. And, you know, given the, the speed at which they they move, there are remarkably few traffic accidents. I mean, almost none. Right. So all that stuff is happening. And then if you turn inwards, your body is doing many things at once on autopilot. Right. 
And then we have this deluded belief that we need to control what's going on. It's crazy because all these things are functioning. And all I would say is if, if you unclutch and complete, you just know what to do. I mean, I find it, I automatically know what to do and I do it and I don't need to keep, in fact, I've just, it's quite funny. While we were waiting, I, um, I was sorting through some papers and someone had sent me this business planning tool. So I just tore it up and put it in the recycling. <laughs> So the next time someone asks me what my business plan is, I'm just going to say my business plan is one word, which is surrender. That's amazing. That really much, is. Works much better. Yeah. Because even too with with a business plan, they're always inaccurate because there's things that happen that are outside of your control and things that you could put together today. And then yeah. there's a big change tomorrow or even today. And then it's outdated and you have to do it over again. So it's yeah. like, what? why well, go through all the, yeah. the headache. At Make and Wellness, our priority is helping you heal and become happy again. We make it easy for you to connect with our exceptional team of therapists right from the comfort and privacy of your device. Not only is this approach more accessible, but it also comes at a much lower cost compared to traditional in-person counseling. We believe no one deserves to suffer in silence and encourage you to work through your challenges so you can live life to the fullest. Call 833-274-HEAL or visit makeandwellness.com to get started with online therapy. I mean, I think it's good. I mean, I've got an MBA and all that. I mean, it's good to have some kind of, you know, financial projection. You, you might say, well, I've got, I've got so many therapists and I've got so many clients and therefore I, you know, I need, I need so many offices and so many, we don't need telephones anymore. You know, you're, you're going to, you're going to need certain things for your plan, right? But your, your projection, but you know, we both know you, one phone call can change everything. Exactly. Someone calls you up and says, please come and open a clinic in San Francisco. I'll pay you to do it. And that all goes in, that all goes in the bin and you need to to change your spreadsheet, right? Exactly. Exactly. And that's very much like life as well. We may attempt to plan things and then things happen that we don't anticipate happening or things that happen that are outside of your control. And it's part of life and acceptance is so important. If not, you're going to be very stressed out. Yes. You probably know the, uh, did you ever hear the John Lennon quote? I think it's John Lennon. He said, life is what happens while you're making other plans. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a great one. So, yeah. I was reading something online the other day, and it was talking about how, and I'm definitely going to butcher this, but it is what it is, about how there's such strength with flexibility and hmm. how there's certain plans like I don't know if it's a bamboo while it's growing, it's very flexible and it flexes with the wind versus other trees that are essentially like whenever there's storms, the trees break because they're not flexible at all and how there's such strength in being flexible and going with the flow. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently that's true of buildings. I once went up the Sears tower in Chicago and it flexes in the wind. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, some of those things would break if they were too rigid. Right. Yeah. How was that experience? Well, I went up in the middle of the night, so it was okay. I went with dark. Yeah. <laughs> but it's cool. pretty tall. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. So when we talk about surrender, hmm. how does surrender impact the decision-making process? The best way for me to explain that is, uh, so there are two quotations. So Swamiji wrote, I don't feel familiar with Bhagavad Gita, which is, it's one oh, of the it's central. Like, it's a holy book, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's one of the central Hindu texts. It's actually remarkably short, mm-hmm. and there have been many, many commentaries. Actually, our prime, our prime, our prime minister Rishi Sunak swore his oath on the Bhagavad Gita because he's Hindu. Oh wow! <laughs> so it's it's cool. going mainstream, right, in yeah. the West. Anyway, so Swamiji wrote a book called Bhagavad Gita Decoded. Oh wow! Uh, I think you can download it free from the website. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's quite long, but. And I, when I was writing Power of Letting Go, I, I studied the 18th chapter, which is about surrender, right? There were two statements which jumped out, out at me. Um, one I've already mentioned, which is surrender is enlightenment, then you will know the truth. And my understanding of that is when you really surrender, you'll just have this experience and you'll realize that's actually what what's going on. I mean, what's actually going on? So in the West, we've generally been conditioned to think that we're separate body minds trying to get what we want and avoid what we don't want, right? I mean, that's the basis of economics, psychology, so many things, right? 
And then uh, I would, I'm sure you're familiar with Eckhart Tolle. He, yes. he talks he talks about that. He says he talks about the body mind and the pain body. So the pain body is, you know, all these in, my mind is all these incompletions because you can find them in your body, right? All mm-hmm. these patterns. Anyway, and and so what the Eastern traditions are saying is the opposite. They're saying you are not the body, you are not the mind, you are pure consciousness. And anyone who does med- silent meditation or yoga properly will experience pure consciousness. And there will be times when there are no thoughts. So what the Eastern traditions are saying, and you know, Bhagavad Gita is one of the central texts, is essentially there's this intelligence which is running everything all the time, and you're it. So what Swamiji says, he says, and this shocks some Westerners. I mean, I was a bit surprised the first time I heard him say it. He said, I'm not here to persuade you that I am God. I'm here to persuade you that you are God. Wow. So basically, you're not this little body mind scurrying around trying to get things. You are God. You happen to be in this body, but you know, in due course, you will drop this body and pick another one, which he describes as like changing a shirt. But this consciousness just goes on and on and on and doesn't die, right? Yeah. So anyway, the relevance of that to surrender is when we surrender, so when we let go completely, which can be, for example, unclutching or whatever else, when we let go completely, this is how I do it, because I, I, I got it from one of his videos. The phrase he uses is Paramashiva, which is supreme consciousness. Right. So a lot of people meditate and they realize, okay, so this is consciousness. And then after a while you realize this consciousness doesn't change. Right. And some people, they learn a bit of Buddhism or something and, and they can't, they get this idea that this consciousness is passive, but what he's saying and what I've experienced and many of people have experienced is this consciousness is extremely active and powerful. So when, for example, you've just been sleeping and you wake up and you're full of ideas, right? It's not passive. You know, it's downloading like crazy, right? Mm-hmm. If you sur- so surrender is enlightenment, then you will experience the truth. Mm-hmm. That's I'm just saying. That's what he, that's what he's talking about. The second statement is, if you surrender, your intuition will tell you what to do. So intuition, my favorite definition, which is from the Encarta Dictionary, is intuition is immediate insight without reasoning. Mm-hmm. So you don't need to analyze. So, for example, if you if you say, oh let's do another another podcast with Perkis or let's open another clinic in, in San Francisco or whatever. And you might sort of do some analysis to make sure it's not crazy, but basically your intuition is giving you an idea to do something. Mm-hmm. And so this surrender allows all of that to happen and it makes you super flexible. So, you know, I, I imagine you've had this experience. You're doing something and someone says, well, how about if we meet for dinner in two hours? And sometimes that feels like the right thing to do. And then something new happens. You know, I mean, I get opportunities from people. They've read the book and they just contact me on LinkedIn. So things can just, they just come from anywhere. And it happens if my experience is when I was clinically depressed, there was none of it. And now there's lots of it. So it's a, it's just like a, a change of state. That's fascinating, John. It makes me think too of my life. And there have been times where where I've been a lot more intuitive and times where I haven't been. But what what happens if there's someone like myself who their intuition has been wrong and then you start to not trust it? Uh, Right. You mean you did something intuitively and it didn't work out. Something bad happened. Yeah. Like or for instance, if you had an intuition about someone and they ended up not doing the right thing or. Something you negative mean, out of trusting your intuition, then you don't trust it anymore. How can you start to get oh, closer see, yeah. with with your intuition? Right. No, I can answer that one, and it, it is it's it's in the books or the books. Uh, yeah. So there is such a thing as false intuition. Oh. Right? So intuition intuition is based on is based on love. So intuition is, as I said, immediate insight without reasoning. And so you just have a feeling about something and you follow. And I mean, I'm all, I'm all in favor of analyzing to make sure you aren't making a mistake. Mm-hmm. You know, like I have a feeling I should write a book. Well, okay, let's see if 10 other books have been written on the same subject right before yeah. we, you know, so, so that's intuition, but there's false intuition and false intuition comes from incompletion. It comes from those pain patterns that we were talking about earlier. So, mm-hmm. so for example, if you have, uh, you, uh, you might have a pain pattern, which is a, a very common one is other people can't be trusted. Oh, 
or oh here's a here's a good one um life does I, I'll, I'll tell you my experience of of this right is i so i've worked away at this and dug my way down to what swamiji calls the root pattern right which is like the root of a tree and it's causing all the problems i've got down now to a, being a crying baby aged one or two but anyway on the way down to the root i discover these two cognitions one was i'm a failure which is a very common one and another one is life doesn't give me what i want and that's as far as i can tell that's my root pattern i'm a failure life doesn't give me what i want and these are these are widespread i mean not everyone's the same but they're very common anyway so this is i'll give you an example of what you've just described so i have invested in various early stage technology companies and one of them i invested in and i i i basically he was dishonest and i lost all my money well in fact it may all come back in due course but for the last few years it's gone away right yeah what i found is if you do lots of completion frequently the money comes back anyway but right now it's it's gone right mm -hmm. so but when i look at what happened so why did i invest in that person's company as opposed to doing something else on my own or with another person. And I realized I did it out of incompletion. So it felt like a good idea. But the pain pattern was, well, one was I'm a failure. So I was hoping that if I invested in his company, he would be successful. Oh. Right. So if I didn't have that pain pattern of I'm a failure, I would not have invested in his company, right? Mm -hmm. I would have been more confident about doing my, something myself or, or attracting an honest honest person with a better business idea, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that pattern, so one is I'm a failure, and the other part is life doesn't give me what I want. So at that stage in my life, I kept sort of trying to do things in business, and it didn't work. Despite all my experience and qualifications, I would do things that didn't work, and it kept reinforcing those two beliefs, which is I'm a failure and life doesn't give me what I want. So back to your point about looking externally, then I would look externally. Well, he looks as though he's going to be successful. So maybe that's the solution. I should invest in his company. Right. So it feels like a good idea, but it's it's coming, it's false intuition because it's coming from pain. Uh -huh. It's coming from pain which I haven't resolved. Uh -huh. So I'm saying I haven't I hadn't completed. So since then I've understood it. I've completed it. So I'm not going to do that again. Right. But now when I look back, this was seven years ago, I could see, and now I understand how I made that mistake. To my mind, that's why, well, that's why I'm very excited about this technique. And it all starts on the individual level with us starting yeah. to see what our patterns are and working on healing those wounds. Because if you don't, it's going to somehow show up again in your life. And I noticed that too with sometimes with clients, if like if I have a client who's single and they keep dating the same type of a person over yeah. and over and over again, and it's yes. the same wound. And the same, same issues. Thing. Yeah, well, I'm sure you know the book, the famous book by um, John Kabat-Zinn, Wherever You Go, There You Are. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, I have a colleague who's a great, she's a great completion teacher. And sometimes people say, I'm not coming to completion classes because we run these free completion classes, right? She said, I'm not, this person said, I'm not coming to completion classes because I'm on holiday for two weeks. And she said, oh, well, is there no internet where you're going? Oh, no, I'm just going on holiday. And she says, well, have a good holiday with your with your incompletions. <laughs> so, <laughs> they're going to go off and have a nice holiday, a nice vacation with their pain patterns, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then go back. I mean, they'll get, you know, they're going to take the patterns with them, right? It doesn't exactly. matter where you go. Yeah. You still take you wherever you go. And that's <laughs> what, you know, I think about sometimes when people move or if they quit their job and go work somewhere else or X, Y, and Z, it's like, you still take you wherever you go. Of course. Actually, oh, the really good news, though, and I'm experiencing this right now, is actually I'll tell you this briefly because this all relates to the completion. Um, so in the book, Power of Letting Go, I talked about my first day at school. I don't know if you remember that bit. Mm -hmm. So I go to school and I have a different accent and they laugh at me and I feel unacceptable. Right. I've since gone deeper than that because this is what happens is we we can all do this. If you keep if you complete that episode, other earlier ones open up. Right. So that was when I was five. Then I went back to being age two or three, and I suddenly realized when I was two or three, I was in this barber's chair, and my my mum took me there and put me in the chair so I could have my hair cut. And I was screaming, and the, the key to it is feeling powerless. That's when you know, right? Mm -hmm. So I was kicking and screaming and screaming and waving my arms around in this barber's chair. 
And the, eventually the barber cut himself by accident. And we've got 10 years of photos. For the next 10 years, my mum cut our hair. So we've got all these photos of terrible haircuts. Right? <laughs> so I went through this phase of just early in the morning, reliving intensely with my eyes closed. And then also I asked Swamiji, like, just remove these, remove all of this. It's, these are all, he calls them dead snakes. They're all, they're all dead, but we give life to these memories, right? Yeah. With that, and then all of a sudden this earlier memory came, which is I'm two or three years old, which is before, no, I'm, I'm one or two years old, which is before language. Mm-hmm. And I'm crying and crying and nobody comes. And then I suddenly remembered when my brother was, because my brother arrived when I was seven. I remember my father saying, it's a good idea to leave babies to cry because it makes them stronger. Right. So now what I've been relieving the last few days, reliving the last few days is I'm one or two years old and I'm in my cot or crib, as you call it, and I'm crying and crying and crying and nobody comes. And that seems to be tight. I have this pattern, which I can see in many parts of my life, which is people don't listen to me. Mm-hmm. And I suddenly realized it probably goes back to I'm one or two years old and no one listens to me. Oh. You know, so it's very, very deep. Anyway, the reason I'm telling you this, and, and and it's good news for anyone listening to it, is if you go back and do this inner work, what's interesting is the outer world changes immediately because essentially you've changed the software. Exactly. And it's truly your perception that dictates what your life satisfaction is. And that's why your book is so important. And I think you're listening to us and you're listening to John, you need to go out today and buy Learn to Let Go, a guided journal. Drop everything that's holding you back. Uh, John, can you share with our audience where they oh, can Oh, it's everywhere. It? It's it's on it's on Amazon in paperback uh, as an ebook and on Audible. And it's in all the bookshops. I went I went to Dubai in January and they've got all they've got it there. <laughs> so. Amazing. Thanks so much, John. And I have One last question for you. What final words of wisdom do you have for our audience before we start to wrap up this episode? If you don't do any form of silent meditation, please start now. That's the first one. And the second one would be when when you start to observe your thoughts, please start doing completion so that you can remove the pain patterns which are causing all of those thoughts. And then your life will improve very quickly. Thanks so much again, John. And remember, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Stuff My Therapist Says, powered by Macon Wellness. If our conversation brought new insights and perspectives into your life, please do not hesitate to share this episode with one person in your circle who will gain positive energy from it as well. Remember, The stigmas of mental health are a thing of the past. If you're ready to take the next step to heal and become happy again, find us at Make and Wellness on your favorite social media networks or reach out to our highly rated Make and Wellness team by dialing 833-274-HEAL. Or you can schedule an appointment on our website at makeandwellness.com. Until we meet again, This is Sarah Macon reminding you that healing happens here.